Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dmitry Abakumov. Uh, I am the seminar chair today, and I'm very glad uh, to see you and to welcome all of you at the third international seminar on computational educational sciences. Uh, our seminar is aimed at uh, building the research community and uh, thinking together on uh, different and challenging problems on the intersection of education, quantitative research, and computational science. Uh, this seminar is hosted by the Center for Computational Educational Sciences of HSE University Moscow and the Open Lab for Psychometrics of Digital Learning. HSE University, or Higher School of Economics University, is one of Russia's top universities. And uh, the Open Lab for Psychometrics of Digital Learning is a brand new lab bringing together scholars and experts in uh, psychometrics, machine learning, and educational sciences from HSE University, University of Colorado Boulder, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Coursera, and Pearson to develop theoretically grounded data-driven explainable solutions to show when and why digital learning happens, to explain how digital learning products work, and to ensure that teaching solutions benefit digital learning around the world. Today, I am grateful to our speaker, Diego Olaya, uh, for his acceptance to present at our, pre uh, at our uh, seminar. Uh, Diego works as a PhD candidate at the Vrij University Universität Brussel in Belgium, and I'm excited uh, to have his talk today on uplift modeling for preventing student dropout in higher education. Uh, before giving Diego the virtual microphone, I would like to inform all of you about the uh, plan of our seminar. So we will start with a 30 or 35 minutes presentation from Diego, and then we will have around 40, 45 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, we still have two options to ask the question. The first one is you can type the question in an open chat and I will voice uh, this question. Uh, and the second option, you can use the raise hand button uh, and I will give you the virtual microphone and you can ask your questions orally by yourself. And uh, finally, I have a small kind uh, gentle suggestion. If possible, please uh, use your web cameras on during the web, uh, the seminar to provide the kind feeling kind of feeling of real physical audience. Uh, thank you so much for your understanding. And now, uh, please join me in our warm welcoming Diego at the virtual stage. Please, Diego, you are very welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you very much for uh, your kind words, uh, Dimitri, and for the invitation to the seminar. Uh, thank you all also for your interest on this research on modeling applied to the specific uh, case of student dropout prevention. Um, I would like first to uh, stress that this uh, talk is based on a paper that we published in May this year. Uh, this is in the Decision Support Assistance Journal, so if you want uh, more details on the techniques and the different uh, ways that we conducted the experiments, then you can go to the paper. Uh, the outline of this presentation, and there is uh, two main components. First, I would like to introduce uplift modeling and uh, define what is uplift modeling, the difference between uplift modeling and what we do in traditional classification uh, applications. Uh, what are the different ways to estimate uplift models, the modeling techniques, and also how we can evaluate the performance uh, of uplift models. Then uh, we will focus more on the case study, which is on the student dropout. Uh, I will uh, talk about a little bit about the data set, uh, the pre-processing steps, the comparison between the uplift modeling estimations and the traditional classification estimations, and the results uh, from our experiments. So first of all, uh, uplift modeling is uh, a predictive analytics uh, technique. Uh, the main idea of uplift modeling is that it uh, estimates uh, the individual level effect of a treatment. Uh, this can be an action, an intervention, and an outcome of interest. So for instance, we have uh, a student. Uh, from this person, we have different information from uh, age, uh, further education level, and so on. And then, uh, based on the attributes of these students, so the academic and prematriculation records, plus also an indicator whether this student participated in or was targeted or was targeted with the treatment. In this case, uh, for example, uh, a tutorial, and an outcome variable which 
is academic performance. Then we apply or we train an uplift model, and then we aim to predict what's the probability of academic uh, achievement if uh, the person receives uh, the tutorial or if the person does not receive the tutorial. So depending on the different probabilities, uh, we might observe that if the student receives the tutorial, there might be a higher probability or of academic, uh, a good uh, performance for, for the student compared to not applying the tutorial. This difference is what we call the uplift score. And in this specific case, then since we observe that the student is uh, positively influenced by the tutoring, uh, compared to not offering the tutorial, then we would decide to target students. So it means that in, for a future students that we observe that there is a, a positive influence on, uh, from the tutorial on this student, then we would target uh, the student. This can also happen the opposite, that we observe that in the scenario that the student uh, does not receive the, 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 tutor, the tutorial, then the the performance of the student or the academic achievement will even be higher. So in this case, we preferred, or according to our model estimates, we would not target uh, the students uh, with the tutoring uh, program. Uh, formally, we define uh, an uplift model as, uh, so we have the uplift score, and this consists of difference between two uh, conditional probabilities. So the first one on the left side is the future state of the academic performance in our example when offering the tutorial, so t equal one. And then we subtract this to the probability of having a, a, a good academic performance when a tutorial is not uh, offered. So this uh, is a difference. It consists in the effect or the estimated effect of uh, giving a tutorial uh, uh, to, to a student. So for another example, then uh, the decision to, uh, rule would be to offer tutorials to only students who are or will most likely have a better academic performance because of the program. Now, uh, do you wonder then what is the difference uh, between uh, applying uh, uplift modeling and traditional classification? So for traditional classification, we have, uh, we uh, learned a classification model based on the attributes from the students, so the academic and matriculation records, and then we predict the academic performance of the student, which is our uh, outcome uh, variable. And this corresponds to ask the question, will the student achieve good performance? Now, the difference is that when we apply an uplift model, uh, we are asking the question, will the student achieve good performance due to the tutoring? So basically, we are, uh, these two tasks are different because the first one, we are predicting the future state of the outcome value or the outcome variable, whereas in the second one, we are predicting what is the effect or the change in the outcome variable when we exert an action. In our example, when we exert uh, a tutorial. Uh, so the summary is like the focus of uplift modeling is the, on the accuracy of the effect of the treatment, whereas in the traditional machine learning techniques or classification, we, we focus on the accuracy on the predicted outcome. Uh, an advantage of uplift modeling is that we can't uh, prescribe, which is the best alternative. So in this case, we have a, bi a binary uh, treatment rule. So we have either we give a tutorial or not, but we can also have different uh, alter alternative tutorials. So we can have a tutorial on English uh, or in economics. And then we want the question is like, which tutorial uh, should be given to uh, every student? Uh, also, in a brief modeling, uh, uh, it's helpful for segmenting the different students. So the, the focus is on identifying uh, persuadables, and those are the students that will be uh, positively influenced when we exert the action. And we want to avoid to target short things. So these are students who will anyhow, in all the cases, respond uh, positively to the action, regardless of what's the treatment. So of course, we would not like to spend resources on these students or uh, resources in, on offering a tutorial because in any way with that tutorial or with the tutorial, the student will respond positively. We also want to avoid lost causes, which are students who regardless of what's the uh, action that we uh, give to them will not uh, respond to the action. And then we also have a, a case which in, uh, in, in the student dropout is, is not so, so evident, but it could also be that by 
given an action to a student, we can even trigger a negative response from the students. So we want to avoid these three different, these three uh, kinds of um, students, so to say, and focus on uh, identifying the persuadables. So those that we expect to have a positive outcome when we uh, offer an intervention, when we give the, a treatment. Uh, how do we estimate uplift moles in a binary outcome and treatment case? We have different approaches. The most simple one is the separate model approach, also uh, known as the T-learner approach. For this, we, since we have in a data set uh, information from, we have treated and non-treated uh, students, then we can train a model only on the non-treated students and a second model only on the treated students. Based on these two models, then we can score uh, uh, future students and estimate the uplift score from them. So basically we have uh, two models and we need to split our initial data set on control and so control non-treated students and uh, treated and treated students. The other approach is that we have a single model where, where we, uh, in addition to the attributes we know from the students, we add an indicator of the treatment assignment, so whether the student was treated or not. And we also add interactions between the treatment and the attributes of these students. So we train only one model, but we expand the input or, or the feature space. Another approach is to relabel the outcome variable. So the outcome variable would not be anymore whether uh, the, there was the student was a dropout or not. But then we would consider a, a positive case and as a student who responded to the action and also students who were not treated and did not respond it. So this will be uh, our positive label, whereas our negative label would be in students who were treated but did not respond it, or who were not treated but responded. So basically we relabel our outcome variable and we train a new uh, a single model with this, uh, uh, with this new uh, outcome variable as a target variable. Uh, the last case is when uh, there is these different algorithms that have been internally modified to uh, estimate the uh, effect of the actions. Uh, for instance, for uh, decision trees, the splitting criterion has been modified to internally uh, make the difference, uh, estimate the, the, the difference uh, between the treated and non-treated uh, responders. For evaluating the uplift models, uh, models. One of the challenges that we have is the so called in the uh, causal inference literature, the fundamental problem of causal inference. For this, we have uh, this consists that we have different uh, test instances. So in this case, we have uh, an instance and a student that was treated, and therefore we observed what's the outcome from this student, from the treated students. But as you may recall from the previous slides, in order to estimate the effect of the, uh, in this case, a tutorial on the student, we need to know, so what's the response when the student is treated, but also the response when the student is not treated. However, in real life, we cannot observe how the student would have responded without the action. So this is a problem where there is a missing value, and this is what we actually need to estimate. The same occurs if we have uh, another instance, another student who was not treated, so we can observe the, how this student responded to the no treatment, then we are interested in estimating again the effect, but for that we need the two uh, future values of the outcome variable. But in this case, we do not observe what was or what would be the response of the student if the student is treated. And the same applies for the other instances. How, so then how we, how we estimate uh, or how do we evaluate the performance on, on an uplift model? For this, uh, we have uh, different uh, steps. So first, we make a ranking of the instances according to the estimated uplift score. So these are students in the test set. We rank them according to from the high uh, uplift score to the lowest uplift score. Then we create uh, different bins. In this case, we created four bins. So we segmented the test set in four groups where the first bin uh, is uh, populated with the students with the highest uplift score and the last uh, bin is with the students with the lowest score. So then based on that, we can 
estimate within each of these bins or segments the number of treated and non-treated students, also the number of responders in the treatment group and also the responders in the non-control group so that we can estimate within each of these segments and observe the uplift. So in reality, we cannot estimate the individual effects so the true or the truly or the observed uh, effect of an action on the individual level. But what we can do is that we can segment the customer base, create these groups of students based on our uplift estimations and within each of these groups estimate uh, an observed uh, treatment effect. So the intuition of this is that if uh, since our students were ranked from the highest uh, uplift score, so from the according to our model, those the students who are in, in the top are those that, that are more likely to respond to the action, then the first segments we should also observe a higher uh, effect of the treatment than in the in the lowest uh, segments. So this can be visualized in different ways. So for instance, we have the, the first uh, plot on the top. We can see, for instance, in this case, we have 10 bins instead of four bins. Uh, and for each of these bins, we have the number of responders in the, for the treatment group. So this is the blue color, the blue bar color. And we can also see what the number of responders to the control group, which is the orange bar color. Then we can observe that ideally, or according to our molds, if our mold works good, then we should observe a higher proportion of treatment responders in the first bins and then decreasing uh, when we start targeting uh, segments of students who might not anymore uh, benefit uh, from the action that we are um, uh, that we are interested in, in determining the effect. The second, the, the plot in the middle is, is related to the, the previous uh, figure. So there we are estimating which within each of the bins, what is the response, uh, so the, the, um, the difference between the response rate in the treatment group and the control group. So as you can see, uh, is, is, uh, we assume that if our model works well correctly, then the effect should be higher in the top bins and then start decreasing. And the last uh, figure is what is known as the uplift curve. In the Y uh, axis, you see that's the cumulative segment uh, uh, wise uplift. And in the top um, axis and the X axis is the targeted population. Uh, so this basically is showing the trade off between what's the gain of targeting, what was the gain of the action when we target uh, uh, more uh, students. So it's expected that in the beginning we have a higher gain than starts flatten when we are targeting students who are not any more responders to our auction and then decreases when we are actually targeting students who might have, uh, who might be harmed by uh, assigning the uh, action. Uh, now, we move to our case study on student uh, dropout. Uh, the data set that we used for our experiment is uh, with approximately 3,000 uh, students, uh, both uh, control and uh, treatment students. We, our predictors are prematriculation and academic information, and our treatment indicator, or the, the, the action that we are interested in evaluating is the, uh, an academic support program, that, which is known as the BAA. And this consists on, uh, or the aim of this program is to improve the academic performance. Uh, and this means reducing the risk of student dropout by offering uh, tutorials at the beginning of the second semester during the first uh, academic year. Our outcome variable here is a dropout indicator. And we define a, a dropout as uh, on the basis of when the student voluntarily abandoned the bachelor program within one year period after finishing the first semester. Uh, as far uh, as the, um, in order to estimate uh, the effect of an action and uh, control or uh, adjust for selection bias, and selection bias, this means that it, since we want to compare what would have been the effect of the action between the treatment and the control group, we need to be sure that these two groups that we are comparing are homogeneous or at least similar. Because otherwise, when we estimate the difference between the, so if we want to estimate, for instance, whether the treatment is effective or not, we, we might get some biases if, for instance, some of the variables um, 
are very different among, I mean, between the two groups. So, for instance, we might uh, get a positive effect of the action, but it might be that the treatment group had uh, more uh, younger people or with different uh, diplomas. So, th this might biases our results. That's why we need to uh, control for the selection bias and be sure that the true uh, populations that we are comparing are homogeneous. For this, we estimate the propensity score which is defined as the probability of being treated given the attributes. So we estimate it for both the control and the treated individuals. And this is uh, what we do basically is that the propensity score is the measure, the similarity measure. So individuals who are uh, in the treatment group are much with individuals in the control group who have a similar propensity score. Yeah, so a similar likelihood to be uh, treated uh, with the, the program. For this, uh, so this is what I'm showing you this table is before we apply the propensity score machine. So we have the top, top 10 uh, variables uh, for which we observe the highest uh, difference. So you can see that uh, in terms of the gross family income, uh, there is a big difference between the untreated, so the control uh, group and the treated group. For that, we estimate the normalized difference. And based on, on this uh, first check of, uh, of the difference in the, in, in the attributes, we realized that we needed to, uh, to, to uh, adjust for this selection bias, and therefore, we apply the propensity score matching. So here, you can see when we uh, compare the normalized difference after the propensity score matching technique, you see that the difference between the untreated and the treated group, so the control on the treated group, the, uh, decreases. So basically now we can say we are comparing homogeneous groups and then we can have at least um, or be uh, assured that our estimated effect uh, is unbiased. Now we also want to uh, test what the difference between uh, what, we, what would be the effect of the action or what's the gain in applying uplift modeling, if there is a gain in applying uplift modeling, compared to a traditional classification uh, approach. So for this, we in the uplift modeling case, we rank based on our uplift scores, so the estimated effect of the action on, 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 the, on the students. And in the case of the traditional classification, we rank according to the predicted uh, future outcome uh, of the, for each uh, student. Then, uh, we uh, compare the performance based on the uplift. So we have our four beans. And so the figure uh, that I'm showing you is uh, the observed uplift in each of the beans when applying an uplift model, in this case, using an XGBoost algorithm. Uh, so you can see, as I showed you theoretically in the beginning, uh, if the model works good, then you should actually observe that the students in the first bean are the ones with the who are most likely to respond. So you should observe a higher uh, effect of the action. And then when you start targeting more, so when you start targeting the second, the third, and the fourth uh, beans, you, you see how actually the effect decreases because of this um, intuition of starting targeting students who might not anymore be uh, responders to the action. So we apply the same for in the traditional classification. We observe actually for the XG boost, so it's the same algorithm, but uh, on a traditional uh, setting, that in terms of the uplift, though it's positive across all the beans, we don't have the same um, high, I mean, the effect of the action is not as, as high as in the first beans uh, compared to the uplift model. And even, uh, so therefore we cannot, uh, we are missing some people if, for instance, we have some constraint in the resources, so we cannot uh, target all the students and we only need, or we can only target the first means that we actually uh, gain higher effect by targeting according to the uplift model than with the, with the XG boost in a traditional setting. For the random forest, the performance is even uh, worse. So you can see for the first bean, the model actually is targeting students who might be harmed by the intervention or by the, by the program. Uh, so one of the ways to visualize the performance of the, of the uplift model is with the uplift curve. I, as I previously um, explained it, we have the cumulative segment-wise uplift, and then we compare it 
how this changes uh, when we start targeting more students. So we see actually, so the farther the curve is from the random line, so the random model is the Dutch line, and that means like targeting randomly students without the model. So you see that the, the curve actually, uh, by applying the model, you have a gain in the effect of the intervention. For instance, if you compare with when you target the 100% of the student base, you get an estimated effect of the action of around 2.9, but you see that you can even have that effect uh, when targeting 40%, but even if you target 50% of your students, you might even have higher effect than the one that you would have obtained if you target randomly and the whole student base. So this means that our uh, model uh, is uh, able to prioritize and actually to boost the effect of the uh, of the our, our tutoring uh, program. Another extension that we wanted to also look at this um, uh, in, 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 our re in our study is that once you have the estimates of the uplift model, you also want to gain some more interpretability and this consists in creating the different profiles of the students. So we can indeed see, okay, the, the model is working, but when, then, when you ask, okay, but it's working, and then what kind of students uh, we should target, or in what kind of students the, 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 the program is expected to work. And for this, we create this uh, rather uh, chart, so we uh, average the dif these uh, different uh, variables for each of the four uh, bins. So the first bin is the bin with the highest, uh, with the, I mean, with the students with the highest estimated amplitude score, and, the, and the, so the first one and the fourth uh, bin is with the lowest estimated amplitude score. So we uh, ideally we should see some differences. And as you can see, for some of these variables, uh, for instance, uh, individuals in the in the in the first quartile used to have a, a lower, I mean, lower attendance to the private school compared to uh, students in the for instance in the last quartile, which are the ones uh, who are the least responding to the to the action. We also observe differences, for instance, in the score of mathematics. So for students who are believed to be treatment responders, the score of mathematics is, is lower compared to the other uh, quartiles. Uh, so uh, what is nice of these um, rather charges is that it not only shows you that or helps you to gain some interpretability uh, in the model estimates, but also seems that, in, for example, we see the number of family members, private school variables. So these are variables that are even before the student uh, starts uh, the program. So it means that we can have a proactive role in targeting. So by observing these variables, which are before the student enrolled in the program, we can already uh, Defined to what students should be um, better to target with this uh, tutoring uh, program. So, as uh, with the summarizing the, the study, uh, I want to stress that uplift modeling is a predictive analytics technique that estimates the individual level effect of a treatment on the outcome of interest. What is different between uplift modeling and traditional classification is that in uplift modeling, we estimate the change in the outcome due to an action or a treatment compared to the traditional classification setting where we are only predicting the future value of the uh, an outcome. Uh, the idea of uplift modeling or the goal of uplift modeling is that we aim to support decision uh, makers to give them actionable insights. So which alternative or which treatment seems to work the best for, for uh, each individual. Uh, also, by showing, for instance, the, the radar chart, you can also create profiles and understand more uh, in what kind of people or students your program work, works the best. Uh, you can also, uh, there is different strategies to estimate the uplift model. So there is a primary approach, the, there is modified algorithms, uh, and none of these strategies is the best. So basically, uh, when you are uh, training an uplift model, you should uh, take into account at least uh, different of these uh, techniques and, and, and train your, your data set and based on, uh, on each data set, you might see that one technique is better than the other one. So there is not really a single technique that works the best in all data sets. Uh, also, uh, something from another study. So our, our study, since the programs, um, so the tutorials were not assigned randomly to students. So this is observational data. 
we uh, stress that we need to control for the bias. In this case, uh, we chose to control for bias um, by estimating the propensity score and the matching based on the propensity score. So it's important to consider that if you are using observational data, you need to check for the bias in your data and control uh, for this bias. Otherwise, you might have a bias estimate of your effect. Uh, as observed in our study, then uh, the program uh, seems to work. And also, if you apply uplift modeling, you might even boost the effect of the, of the tutoring program in, the, in this university. For the, uh, the profiling, you can also uh, create a, a, a better feeling on what kind of uh, or, or the predictions the model uh, is given to uh, have again in the inter interpretability of the model uh, estimates. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, finish with uh, the summary. Uh, with, I also left some uh, links to, our, to the software that is used on the uplift modeling applications uh, in Python and in R. And there is also some references, for instance, for the meta learners, the two model approach. There is also for a modified outcome approach and uh, for the modified algorithm. So these are papers, uh, recent papers that of techniques that can be used to estimate the uplift uh, score. And um, so thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, I would be glad to hear from you. Great, thank you so much, Diego, for your uh, very interesting, great presentation. And uh, now we can uh, go to the second uh, stage uh, at, of our seminar, of the question and answer session. And I have my first question uh, to make the audience asking their question. So uh, my question is, um, so I'm wondering, have you uh, considered the survival analysis and survival models, survival methods, as an alternative approach uh, in your project? I don't mean uh, this exactly this paper, but just in general, uh, to work with this data. Uh, so in this in survival analysis, we um, uh, we model the time to event, so time to drop out. And in this case, we can, for instance, model the effect of different treatments, which can make this time to event longer, longer, or sh or shorter. It depends. And if you consider this, uh, could you please share your opinion uh, or to compare? Um, uh, the method you use, so uplift models uh, and uh, survival models, in terms of their benefits and limitations. Yeah, well, there is, that's a very interesting question because indeed uh, there is recent studies uh, in uplift modeling and in general in the literature on estimation of uh, individual treatment effect, where we are interested in uh, analyzing what is how the actually the effect of the action diminishes through the time. So as you're saying. Uh, but the difficult, I mean, one of the main difficulties for this is that then you need data for each of the moments. Uh, so for the first moment, what action was applied, what was the outcome, but then you need to keep recording uh, the next uh, steps and then at some point see whether the action, that the effect of the action is uh, diminishing. So uh, as it could be, uh, this is an extension basically. So this is... Um, a static uplift uh, approach, the one I presented, but basically you can also uh, apply this uh, static approach to every uh, moment in time and evaluate how the effect of the action is changing uh, accordingly. Um, so I would say you can extend this approach and use the, uh, so you have pretreatment variables at time one, but then you can also use pretreatment variables at time two and then estimate again the uplift modeling and then have different uplift uh, estimations or uplift scores to see how the, the, the effect of the, tri the treatment is uh, evolving through, through time. Yeah. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's very interesting. And may I ask one more question? Uh, so, is it possible to um, to estimate like simultaneously different kinds of treatment in this model? For instance, like to um, uh, like tutorials, um, yeah, like uh, like meetings before lectures, or another kinds of treatments in this in, in like within the one model. Uh, it is possible that is uh, that's actually one of the papers I've published on multiple treatment uh, uplift modeling. 
Uh -huh. There is recently also uh, new techniques that you can uh, modify, I mean, algorithms that are already modified internally to uh, take into account the multiple treatments. So indeed it's possible, as I said also in the beginning, that instead of having a tutorial and a tutorial, you can have different types of tutorials. And then here the, the decision or, 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 well, the objective would be to define which tutorial uh, should be applied uh, to each of the students. So it is possible. Um, then, of course, there is different alternative because you either set one baseline in scenario where there is uh, no tutorials and then you compare all the different types of tutorials against these scenarios, or then you have to compare the effect of each tutorial against the other tutorials. And for this, you get different estimates for each individual, but you instead of having one uplift score, for, for tutorial one, then you have different uplift score for tutorial one, tutorial two, and tutorial three, and so on. And then based on that, uh, which is the max, or the, I mean, the, the largest uplift score, then you should uh, be able to say, okay, then the best tutorial for this student is, um, is this one. So for, for the tutorial with the highest uh, uplift score, basically. I so see. it is possible indeed. And it's currently being studied, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, we have questions in our chat. So, Diego and the audience, you can read this question, but of course, for uh, our um, video version of the, of the seminar, I will voice uh, this question. So, the first question is from Anastasia. Academic leave, when a student takes a break from university for six months or a year, and then returns to the same course, is a common phenomenon in Russia. Uh, were there any such cases in the sample? If so, how did you work with them? So, you, well, as we defined dropout in this specific uh, study, were students who, uh, after uh, one year of applying the program, uh, yeah, churn or, or left the school. Uh, but here we are not considering students who are actually re-entering into to the to our uh, to, to the school. So, yeah, the, in, in our definition, we do not consider those students. Uh, so, yeah, in, in this case, I would say. Um, it, it is. It might be possible to consider. Yeah, but it, it, I think then we are uh, asking a different question because then it's not how we can um, diminish the dropout rate uh, in the. So our question here basically is how we can uh, retain students in the in the first semesters because thus uh, when we observe that the majority of students drop out, but we are not really uh, focused on like the students who returned. I think that would be a different um, approach. Uh, and that's not actually, that's out of the scope of our research at the moment or for this specific study. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the second question in our chat is from uh, Irina. So did you think about using techniques, technique of uplift modeling for preventing student dropout in online learning, for instance, in online degrees? Will uh, they be similar or different from results of offline learning data analysis? What do you suppose? Uh, I do think that it's, there is a big possibility to apply uplift modeling in online learning. Uh, now here uh, we need to consider then what kind of interventions we would be interested in analyzing um, because uh, there is plenty of data in from uh, yeah from online learning uh, but then um, I, we, we would need to know what interventions we would like to evaluate and uh, so whether for instance to um, some students we sent certain emails to uh, remember them that they are enrolled in certain uh, online courses. So we could, for instance, test whether sending these emails might have a positive impact on uh, retaining the, the students uh, uh, on, on, on their, uh, I mean, in, in this uh, specific uh, course. So it, there is plenty of opportunities. I, I mean, in general, Uplift Modeling is designed to estimate the effect of actions on individual level. So it is possible actually to applied in different applications. The upper model has been used, for instance, in, in medicine to uh, determine which is the best treatment for a certain patient. Uh, in marketing as well, which is the best channel that should be used to also approach to a, to a client. Uh, so there is many uh, ways to apply uplift modeling indeed. Here, what I think is important is to define what intervention or what action would be interested to uh, analyze in, in the case of online learning. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, okay, next question is from Wim. So, and Wim will ask uh, these questions uh, orally. So, Wim, you can unmute yourself, please. Welcome. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diego, for the nice presentation. Um, to be honest, um, uplift modeling is completely new to me. So, I, I simply have a, an informative question. Um, maybe could you go back to slide seven, I think? Yes. Um, so here you compare traditional uh, classification with uplift modeling, but in the traditional classification, you do not include the treatment indicator. So yeah, when I think about traditional methods, I, I think, for instance, of uh, logistic regression, you could include the treatment indicator. In that uh, regression model, you can also include interaction terms with uh, various uh, participant characteristics in order to make uh, good estimates of the probability of success uh, depending on whether the treatment uh, was followed or not. But maybe this is not what you mean by traditional classification. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to stress or the difference that I wanted to stress between the two approaches is that in traditional, so in, in the setting of um, yeah, a, cl a classifier, we want to predict the future uh, outcome. So in this case, we would like to predict uh, whether a student will drop out or not, right? But what we do in uplift modeling is to predict whether the student will drop out or not due to the, so basically what the effect of given a certain intervention. In a traditional setting, you just want to estimate the future value of your outcome variable, whereas in our approach, we do not estimate the future state, but we, I mean, we need to estimate, of course, the two possibilities, but in order to estimate what is the effect of the action. It's, it's more like the question, is it effective to uh, target this student because it will, uh, decrease the, the their the probability that the student will drop or whereas in the other setting in the traditional setting we are we will target the student only on the basis on the the risk of the student of dropping so on only the probability of of dropping out i don't know if it's clear uh, my answer or, or or not yet yeah because if you, if you estimate or if you predict the achievements um, in a traditional classification, you can also take into account uh, the treatment indicator, whether or not a person had that treatment. Yes, indeed, you can take into account the treatment indicator, but then you are predicting the academic, the, the academic uh, achievement. Whereas in uplift modeling, you are not predicting academic, academic achievement, but you are predicting the change in academic uh, achievement based on the, the intervention that you are given. So you are predicting the change in, 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 the, in, in the performance of, of, the, of the student. So you are not predicting the performance of the student, but you are predicting the change in this performance due to mm -hmm. uh, exerting an action. That's why. What does the main difference? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, we have a new question in our chat. Uh, Daria uh, first uh, uh, writes, she writes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. You used um, research data uh, from three bachelor programs from Chilean University. Do you plan to broaden your research by using cases in different countries and extrapolate the results to other objects because the models of educational processes may vary according to the cultural and national, spe nat national specifics? Uh, yes, uh, we have received that question before indeed. Uh, however, the focus of this study was to uh, more on applying uplift modeling to this um, specific uh, to a student dropout and see how uplift modeling could help to, uh, for targeting, for customized targeting uh, in, 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 in this in, uh, data mining and educational setting. Uh, now, uh, comparing different um, like uh, retention programs across different uh, geographies of different universities indeed my vary. So in this case, we might determine that this intervention is effective for this specific university, for this specific academic program. So 
it would be very interesting also to replicate replicate this study in other universities. Uh, what might change, of course, is that in the intervention might change in those universities. Uh, so we are also not claiming that the best way to uh, retain students is by applying tutorials. There is also a different uh, other uh, interventions or actions, retention programs that can be implemented. And this might vary also uh, among different universities. Uh, so I think uh, indeed this study could be extended by uh, applying uplift modeling in in also uh, other uh, universities and uh, and see whether indeed there is a gain in applying this uh, i mean whether there is a, a like a boost in the effect of the retention program um, in 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 that specific uh, setting indeed uh, we but yeah we of course we cannot generalize and say that because in this specific study and this specific data we believe that tutorials will be uh, beneficial all the time so uh, that's not the idea. We were basically uh, more proposing uplift modeling as a tool to customize uh, the assignment of the of tutorials. Okay, thank you so much. And I think that the same. The next question is kind of uh, in the same way. So Gregory is asking, don't you think that variables performance in English courses, uh, first semester and performance in first semester are dependent? So slide 16, and how can tutorials negatively affect students, like negative uplift? Yeah, uh, we uh, stress in our paper as well that that's a very rare case that we, uh, I mean, addressing first uh, the second question. Uh, usually in uplift modeling, indeed, you, in, I mean, for some applications, you might observe, uh, for instance, in marketing, you might be, uh, I mean, by offering, by sending uh, flares, or by sending emails, you um, actually might uh, annoy customers and cause the opposite effect. Uh, but in the setting of a student dropout, that doesn't is not that popular. That by offering a tutorial, you would trigger the student to 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 leave the, the university. So indeed, in 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 this setting, it's, it's less. Um, evident to have this case that you might trigger the student. But uh, since this is also part of the uh, uplift literature and, 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 and different segmentations, what you expect in uplift modeling, and that's why it's also here uh, implemented. Um, now for the question on the performance in, 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 in English. Uh, sorry, I heard uh, some noise. Uh, uh, can uh, you hear me? Put, can the audience please mute yourself? Yeah, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so your question about the performance, you, you say that it could be correlated performance in the first semester with the performance in, in English in first semester? That's, that's, that's a question, right? Uh, mm. Like, yeah, yeah, I think the question is on the, like, on the possible dependence between uh, performance in English courses first semester and performance and like general performance in first semester, as I understood it correctly. So Gregory can, uh, yes, yes, he responds yes, uh, uh, yeah. Whether there might be a correlation, well, the difference here is that the performance in the first semester is taking into account in general uh, all the, the the grades or the scores in uh, across all the courses for for these students in in, in the first semester. Uh, but uh, I do not think it's including the English uh, the performance in English because this specific uh, variable was set apart since um, so the tutorial is not a single tutorial. There is four different types of tutorial: English tutorial, in economics, mathematics, and uh, statistics. What we uh, did in the end for this study it was to put them all together. So if a student receives a tutorial, regardless of this tutorial being English or economics, we label this student, we flag this student with the tutorial. So um, this variable specific English performance that comes with the um, with the separation, but it's not counted as part of the performance in the first semester. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we have a new question in our chat. So Evgeny is asking, perhaps uh, I missed something or didn't understand it properly. Please, can you repeat how we interpret the radar chart? For example, will the tutoring be effective for private schoolers? Does the radar axis 
present the uplift score or the level of some variable. Okay, so the idea of the radar chart is to um, help in the interpretability of the uplift models. So recall that we uh, create four segments. It can be more, but for our application, we created four segments. And these segments, so the quartile one, remember the students are um, ranked according from the highest score, the uplift score to the lowest score. So the first quartile, you have students that, we, that the model we lift are, might, might respond to the action. And the lowest quartile are the students that the, the, yeah, that the model believe that they won't respond to, to our uh, tutoring program. So now what we do is that within each quartile, we average uh, the values of for these um, variables here, for instance, and then to, in order to compare. So we want to see whether, for instance, in, in now um, addressing the private school, whether, for instance, the students in the first quartile, most of them attended to a private school or compared to the last quartile. So in this specific case, we observed that in the first quartile, um, there is actually less students attending to a private school compared to those in, 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 the, in the lowest quartile. So it means um, that uh, the likely responders to our tutorials or those uh, students that we should target with our tutorials are mostly students who didn't attend a uh, private school. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, basically answering. That also can be, for instance, for, for the scoring mathematics, it will mean that we should also target the students uh, with the low scores in mathematics. Since you see that in the quartile four, the score in mathematics actually is, is higher compared to that. So it means that for the quartile for those that shouldn't be uh, targeted because the effect of the tutorial uh, is expected to be low, um, it's actually they have the high, the largest score in mathematics. So yeah, that's how we should uh, read the, should be the, read the, the chart. I don't know if it's clear. Or you can also ask me again. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have a question in our chat. Uh, yeah, from Ekaterina. What do you think? How results result of your research can be used in the in the university? I mean, if we know that some categories of students would drop out uh, of the program, what will be what will we do about it? Yeah, I think this question more about not about methodology and this specific method, but more mostly about like educational policy. Yeah. yeah, so the, the focus here of our study was also to help the decision makers or, or the, actually the, the ones that are designing this program in order to understand more whether what kind of students should be prioritized to being offered these tutorials. So actually how it's done nowadays is that the program is open to all students and they apply it, uh, but um, there is a limitation in the places uh, of students that can take the tutorial. So the idea of using this model is that since we can uh, or based on this model, we can identify it in what kind of students we believe the, the tutorial will work or prevent them to drop out. So we could prioritize them so that, for instance, if they, um, they, they, they tell us, okay, we want to participate in the program, we can prioritize the, 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 the action to them so we can offer the, the action, uh, so the, the tutorials to these kind of students. Now, what follows is that we can deploy our model so it means targeted students based on our model. And afterwards, ideally, uh, in order to validate whether what if our model is, uh, is targeting correctly students or not, would be actually to estimate the effect of the action after the model is applied. Yeah. So it's uh, to help program designers in understanding what kind of students should be targeted. Also to prioritize the students that should receive the tutorial um, and uh, third, when the model is deployed afterwards to evaluate whether, uh, our, well, actually, whether our model works in reality or not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm, yeah. We have uh, one more question from Vladimir. So he is asking, could you please clarify the matching technique you used? Could you please? Could you please? Could you please clarify the matching technique you used? Okay, so the matching technique that we use, so uh, as you recall, when I explained, we need to compare homogeneous groups of individuals, so homogeneous treatment and control group. Uh, 
what do we uh, consider as a similarity uh, metric is the propensity score. And the propensity score is the probability that a student will be treated based on its attributes. So we estimate this for the students in the control group and in the treatment group. And then the idea is that we match a student from the treatment group uh, with a student in the control group who has a similar propensity score. So a student who has a similar uh, probability in the control group to be treated. So that's how we uh, perform the, the matching of the students. So if you can see in the, on the table on the right side, uh, we are doing one-to-one -one matching. So we have the same uh, number of treated and controlled uh, students in the end, uh, because we are basically looking for, for someone in the control, in the treatment group, uh, a similar individual in the control group on the basis of the propensity score. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have uh, questions, the audience? More questions? No? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Diego, for your uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, like from my point of view, I think that uh, like this, for me, it was also a very new method. And I have uh, a lot of ideas how we can combine this method with another kinds of statistical and machine learning techniques. For instance, with logistic regression, with uh, uh, survival analysis, with uh, and, and other kinds of uh, classification, prediction, te prediction, te prediction techniques. Uh, so, uh, Again, thank you very much for your presentation. We will, uh, yeah, we have a uh, great talk, Diego. Thank you. It was from Samuel, uh, from our chat. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of uh, 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 thankful uh, uh, messages in our chat. Now, we will produce uh, the video and we will make it, I think, uh, uh, we need a couple of days. I think by next Wednesday we will make this video, make it public, and uh, usually um, on uh, YouTube uh, the audience can also chat their questions or or email you uh, after uh, they watch your presentation. And uh, next seminar we plan uh, we plan our next seminar in October. Unfortunately, unfortunately due due to this uh, COVID situation we have some replacement and we now manage uh, this situation and I will announce, uh, I will send you information with announcement, uh, I hope soon. So thank you very much and I, by, by our tradition, I would like to uh, propose the audience to unmute uh, themselves and to join me in warm applauses uh, to Diego. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For your... Uh, Great presentation. Uh, I wish all the audience uh, to be healthy because it is important at this time. And I hope to uh, see you next time. Thank you very much, Diego, again. And thank, thank you very much. much. Everybody thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.